In betting circles, Billy Walters is as much a legend as Phil Mickelson is in the world of golf. A profile in 2015 in ESPN the magazine called him the world's most successful gambler. In his new book, he goes into detail about his career and his system for sports wagering. Walters has also been a frequent target of law enforcement, indicted several times and in 2017 convicted of insider trading, which sent him to federal prison. But most of the attention around his story now focuses on his allegations about Mickelson. And Billy Walters joins us now. Billy, thank you for being with us. How did you and Phil Mickelson become acquainted in the first place? Well, Jeremy, thank you, first of all, for having me. Second of all, uh, Phil and I uh, developed a, a gambling partnership together. We were betting on sports. Uh, we, we had a betting partnership for five years, and we were friends for eight years. Well, why did you decide to form a partnership? Well, uh, he had some places he could bet, uh, and although uh, a portion of it uh, was much greater than I could bet uh, individually, so we developed a partnership. It was just a simple partnership. We both put up, you know, we both put up half the money. Uh, uh, we made bets, and uh, we, uh, we, we shared in the wins or losses. How would you describe, Billy, Phil Mickelson's gambling habits? how much he bet, well, how he went about doing it. Yeah, first of all, Jeremy, uh, Phil Mickelson's a very small part of my book. He's two chapters out of 28. And Phil Mickelson is only in my book because in order to tell the story, he has to be in the book. And, and basically his role in my book is about the fact that when you're right, I was convicted in the, in, in, and went to prison for insider trading. And I believe that Phil Mickelson had came forward and testified and done nothing but tell the truth as he told the FBI on two previous occasions, I don't think I would have ever gone to prison. There's no way I could tell that story unless I shared what my experience was with Phil uh, and the relationship I had with him. Uh, as far as any, any gambling he and I did, it's a, it's a minuscule part of my book. You know, the book I wrote, I wrote my motivation, it wasn't it, uh, to disclose anything whatsoever about Phil or our relationship, it was, it was a talk about addiction, it was talking about people with adversity, I've dealt with both. And as, as sports betting got legalized, which has been a dream of mine, uh, I, I wanted to write uh, the encyclopedia of sports handicapping and sports betting. And uh, 10 years ago, Jeremy, I wouldn't have sold this information for mm. $20 million, but I'm not getting any younger. And uh, I wanted to write this. I wanted to share it with sports fans and uh, leave it as my legacy. Yeah, and I want to get into your thoughts about the widespread legalization here in the United States of sports wagering since the 2018 Supreme Court decision. But as you know, Billy, so much news has been generated by what you said about Phil Mickelson. So give us an example. Let's say a typical weekend in football season for Phil Mickelson. What would that look like for him in terms of the wagering that he was doing? Well, Jeremy, it's all in the book as far as the specifics, the breakdowns of the weekends. You know, I, I mean, it, like I said, we took it from the records we did. I don't remember exactly what each week, each, week, each weekend amounted to or what it didn't amount to. But, again, it's all in the book, and it's in the book strictly for, for one reason, one reason only, to explain what our relationship was, nothing more, nothing less. Well, let's talk about what you say. You say in the book you think that if Phil Mickelson had said certain things about you publicly, things that you say he told the FBI privately, you might not have gone to prison in 2017. Why do you believe that to be the case? What could he have said that would have made a difference? Well, first, first and foremost, Jeremy, I went to trial. There was one person who testified against me, and only one. And that person, two years prior to that, had denied emphatically that he'd ever given me insi any inside information. And his You're talking about was, Tom was, Davis. Right. That's correct. And his, his credibility in the trial was completely, absolutely destroyed. We caught the guy in, you know, in excess of 25 lies. Uh, at the end of the day, there were two huge mistakes uh, as far as I was concerned after the fact. Number one, I didn't testify. My lawyers were convinced that Tom Davis was, so, uh, was such a liar that if the jury couldn't believe him, they couldn't convict me. But if Phil Mickelson had came forward and testified because of who he is and his celebrity and simply told the truth, nothing more, nothing less, as he had in two previous interviews with the FBI, the jury would have heard from someone else other than Tom Davis. And as a result, I don't think I would have ever been convicted and I would have ever gone to prison. 
And uh, while I was in prison, unfortunately, you know, I had, I had some family issues and uh, some very serious family issues. My daughter committed suicide and it was a very difficult time for me and my family in our life. So Billy, why do you think Phil Mickelson declined to offer testimony on your behalf? Well, Phil Mickelson uh, was defending two cases at the same time. He was not only uh, involved in this insider trading case, which basically amounted to nothing, but he was involved in a money laundering case that involved him and two other men that had been going on for a year prior to anything coming up with any, any, any insider trading. And although I can't answer for them, but the only realistic uh, answer I could come up with was he was probably concerned about being asked, asked questions about that also. In the book, again, Billy, you talk about the vast sums of money that Phil Mickelson, you say, wagered. How much money are we talking about? Uh, the money, I have detailed records of every account I have, uh, every bet we made, whether we won, whether we lost. I keep those for, you know, for, for tax reasons. So I have complete, absolute, you know, detailed records, not only with every bet that I made with Phil or, or was involved with Phil, but with every, every, anyone I've ever done business with. Okay, after <clears throat> I'd gone to prison and got out, I met two other uh, individuals that, that uh, I hadn't met before and very credible individuals who I found out that he started doing business with them in 1995. And they had detailed records, the uh, same as we did. Armin Katayan, who, who was involved with me in writing this book, who was an investigative reporter, uh, interviewed them, uh, vetted them. Simon Schuster's lawyers uh, did the same and, uh, you know, uh, were convinced that they were accurate. And as a combination of the gross wagers that, uh, that, that he did with us and, and the gross wagers he did with them, that's where the figures come from. It's a combination of those two figures. Right, and the figure is, again, about a billion dollars, right? That would be in gross wagers, yes, and, they, and, and probably lost around $100 million. But the other thing is, as I, as, I, as I share in the book, Jeremy, I personally don't have an issue with that. Phil Mickelson's made in excess of a billion dollars. But he can do whatever he wants to with his money. It's his business, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I know the public may have an interest and probably... You know, uh, you know, if he has sponsors or, or, or whatever that maybe he has an additional responsibility that others don't to disclose those type of things. But you know, uh, if you make an excess of a billion dollars and you lost a hundred million, mm. uh, again, that's his business, his money. As far as I'm concerned, he can do what he wants to with it. Billy, tell us about the phone call you say that he made to you prior to the 2012 Ryder Cup. Well, I, I got a call. He was playing in the Ryder Cup at Medina in 2012, and I got a call, and he wanted to bet $400,000 on the U.S. team to win the Ryder Cup. I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I asked him, I said, have you lost your mind? And, uh, and he said, I said, don't you know what happened to Pete Rose? I said, you know, you betting on the Ryder Cup, uh, you would destroy your entire career. I said, you're looked at as a modern-day Arnold Palmer, um, and I don't want any part of it. And uh, he never made the bet. Uh, and he hung up the phone and that was the end of it. Uh, he called and wanted to make the bet, but the bet was never made. I never had any discussion with him ever prior to that involving betting on golf. I never had any discussion with him after that uh, about any type of potential bet on any golf. That was a one and only time, but uh, literally I think he just probably got carried away in the moment and, and decided they were a lock to win it or whatever and wanted to make that bet. Billy, here's what Phil Mickelson said last week in a statement. I'm sure you've seen it. I never bet on the Ryder Cup. While it's well known that I always enjoy a friendly wager on the course, I would never undermine the integrity of the game. I have also been very open about my gambling addiction. I have previously conveyed my remorse, took responsibility, have gotten help, have been fully committed to therapy that has positively impacted me, and I feel good about where I am now. What are your thoughts about that statement? Well, I don't see anything, anything in that statement that refutes anything that I said. I never said he bet on the Ryder Cup. What I said was he attempted to bet on the Ryder Cup. I don't see anything whatsoever in that statement him denying that he attempted to bet on the Ryder Cup. So uh, I, I, it's, uh, I think, you know, it's pretty obvious that the fact that he didn't deny the fact he bet on the Ryder Cup, what happened? I never said he bet on the Ryder Cup, and to my knowledge, he never did. He attempted to. And uh, so that's, that's really the only response that I have to that. And there's no denial about any of your other allegations? No, he didn't deny them because the allegations are truthful and, and, 
And I think he's, you know, I, I'm sure he knows that we have, you know, we have records. I don't think there's any question about that. I mean, he's confirmed basically what we said, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, he didn't bet on the Ryder Cup as far as I know. He attempted to make a bet on the Ryder Cup, as I said earlier. Uh, prior to that, he never, ever talked about betting on any type of a golf event before or after. It was just a one time that he called uh, to place a bet, and it, but it never happened. What kind of relationship have you had with Phil Mickelson since he declined to testify on your behalf? Well, uh, I haven't spoken to him until recently. Uh, the entire time I was in prison, when my daughter committed suicide, I never heard a word from him. When I got out of prison, I, I was at a club. Uh, I was getting ready to play golf. I was on the driving range. Uh, on the way to, uh, I left the, the range from warming up. I was on the way to get in the cart. He walked up to me and said, he was so it was so glad he was so glad to see me again and he was glad to see I was out playing golf again and uh, we uh, that was pretty much the conversation and uh, that was it and I haven't spoken to him uh, since Billy you don't name any other golfers in the book as big time gamblers um, but you know this world you've been involved deeply in golf for a long time as a course developer, as an amateur player, uh, as someone who wagers on his own golf game frequently, how would you describe the culture of gambling on the PGA Tour? Well, I, I, I don't know about the PGA Tour. I can't speak to that. But as far as golf's concerned, I think we all enjoy a friendly wager. Some, some, uh, you know, end up playing higher than others do. Some of them bet a, some people bet a lot of money. Some people bet a small amount of money, but. It's competition. I think we all enjoy that. And uh, but as far as the PGA Tour is concerned, I, I can't comment on that. I, I don't have any knowledge about anyone else's on the PGA Tour. Billy, we mentioned earlier the 2018 Supreme Court decision that made sports wagering widely legal outside the state of Nevada. The business is growing exponentially. ESPN is in the business now. What do you see as the as the potential for the industry? Well, I think it's long. I think it's it's overdue, and I think it has tremendous potential. I think it's a good beginning, but I, I, I think there's a lot that needs to take place in order for it to fulfill its potential. Uh, you know, this is something I always dreamed of. You can, you, can, you can bet on a sporting event. You can have some fun. You can watch a game. You can do it in the comfort of your home. You can do it with someone who's going to pay you. Uh, there, there, it can create jobs. It can create taxes. I see everything, everything that I see about the potential is extremely positive. Clearly, in, you know, in, in anything, there's going to be you know, some issues that you're going to have to deal with. There will be people who get addicted to, to gambling, and that'll have to be dealt with also. And the people who have these licenses uh, that are booking these bets, they have a responsibility to monitor that and monitor it seriously. Because as, as in anything, whether it's alcohol, whether it's sports betting, or, or whether it's consumption of food or anything, people are, or alcohol, people are subject to, uh, to addiction. And when those things happen, the, the industry has, uh, has a responsibility to address that. Billy Walters, his new book is Gambler, Secrets from a Life at Risk. Billy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate you having me.